Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Um, between a talk between my uh, the panelists and myself, uh, just very quickly to let you know that there is automatic closed captioning in place for today's conversation. It'll come up as an option on the bottom of your Zoom, and you can switch that on um, if you if you would like it. Uh, we will also, time willing, be taking some questions at the end. So if you do have questions throughout the talk, you can put them in the Q and A function, and we'll talk about them in the last ten minutes or so. Um, as a brief introduction, my name is Sarah Muthi. I am a curator, producer, and writer uh, specializing in performance art. Uh, I'm also a teaching assistant in the Department of Philosophy at Trinity College. Uh, today, my panel consists of Isidore Epstein, Brian Hand, and Leanna Herlihy. And we'll kind of be just reflecting on the kind of legacies of Irish performance art in the 1990s uh, for this kind of contemporary generation of practitioners. Um, first of all, I will be introducing our panel and then they'll each speak more individually about their practice. And then we'll start to compare and contrast some of the experiences and issues surrounding their work. Um, yeah, so um, Isidore Epstein is an emerging artist and performer working in Dublin. She writes her performances from her research of art history and mythology. She has had performances at Emma, the RHA, Temple Gallery and Studios, Ormond House, Kuva Exhibition, Kuba Exhibition Lab Helsinki. She's also currently a recipient of the Fire Station Artist Studios at the Digital Media Award. Uh, Brian's hand uh, Brian Han's art practice is broadly concerned with uh, creatively exploring and researching events, spaces, agents, and ideas from the past. In the past, he believes we can find alternative images that disrupt the naturalness of the present. Han's practice is diverse. He has made temporary public works in time-based installations, worked in different collaborative outfits, and published critical writing. Han also teaches, has taught fine art full time since 2003 and is currently the head of the Department of Sculpture, Sculpture and Expanded Practice at NCD. He also studied at NCD, the Slate School of Art and DIT. Han lives and shares the studios in Blackstairs with Orla Ryan. Last but not least, Leanne Herlihy is a live action artist based in Dublin, pairing gestures with Pairing gestural actions with in-depth research, their practice moves within and beyond the queer identity. Leanne is currently manifesting a new body of work in collaboration with Project Art Center, which strives towards the reclamation of spatial ontology of nowhere um, for socially peripheral voices. Most recently, Leanne was awarded a project uh, studio at Temple Bar Gallery and Studios. So that's just a brief introduction to our panelists today. Um, I'll first ask Isadora if she'd like to speak about our practice for a little while, and then we'll hear from Leanne and Brian, and then we'll continue the conversation from there. If you want to take it away, Isadora. Oh, hi. Um, so, yeah, just to kind of introduce what my practice is, uh, kind of sort of like three act in the way that I make work. Uh, the first is kind of through reading and research, like quite frequently, like responding to like different archives, whether, I don't know, like I've worked with places like the RHA or the stuff, folklore, kind of like private thing, library time. I kind of open that up a kind of collaborative sort of situation where I'm working with like visual artists, musicians, dancers, anyone who wants to be involved kind of thing. And then from that, a performance is made. Um, and I normally like doing these in kind of uh, unexpected places. I have done uh, shows on trains, on, uh, on boats, uh, and people's uh, I back to the kind of reading because i guess i'm really fascinated how it's from give it into this public moment of performance um i read a book that i really liked last week and i just really want to talk about it so i'm just going to use it as a way to frame my work um it's and as more things and really things or whatever this is what's so great about this book is it's talking about in uh, late capitalism how contemporary art can be seen in these three aesthetic categories of zany cute or interesting unfortunately i think that um my work falls under the category of zany which is a word that i absolutely 
despise. Um, but I think it really is a good way of encapsulating a lot of what I do. I found out from reading this book that um, zany comes from the word zani, which is a, a commedia dell'arte term uh, for like an itinerant servant who's kind of you know, doing temporary work and is sort of an odd jobber and is just kind of frantically trying to keep up with all these different jobs. And the, as an artist, um, I kind of feel like that that's what making work is like uh, in Dublin, because whether that's like me working to try and support my arts practice or just trying to justify that I'm making art kind of feels like kind of taking on all these odd jobs all the time. And I'm kind of fascinated by this sort of um, blurring of sort of cultural and occupational performances that happens in inevitably when you start making performance work. Um, so frequently, I think that my job, that um, that my work is kind of this like performing of fictional jobs. Uh, like I, I kind of would. I've done pieces where I've been like a travel agent or a, a male painter or the moon uh, or a matchmaker or a clairvoyant. Um, so, uh, it's just like, for example, I, I did a show at the Kevin Kavanagh gallery that was, uh, part of the Fringe Festival in 2019 and, and I made these, um, business cards for it, um, and I kind of handed them out both to kind of get people to come to the performance, but also they were used as kind of props in the show as well, um, and I think that this is all very much sort of wrapped up in this fantasy of having some sort of expertise or skill. So that's why I kind of use these fictional jobs. And it's this kind of hope, I guess, with my performances that at some stage I'll end up being this sort of exquisite version of, of self because I think frequently I, I'm not the person that I, I want to be, you know, it's just a, what happens with living. But I, um, I think back to this term of zaniness, I think that I kind of, agreed to even talk on this panel in a kind of in the context of that sort of I don't know uh, zany impulse that I, I really do not have the expertise and um, know how to be talking as part of this panel but it is sort of expected now as an artist that not only that can I make art but that I can somehow talk about it in this like fluid and important way which I don't want to disappoint you but I'm not going to be able to. Um, so after um, this idea with this kind of job and fictional expertise element, I think maybe I'll talk about one more show that I did, which was this uh, taking on kind of the role of a male painter, um, I, which I did for the RHA. And it was for this um, seminar, which is about the lives of the artists. So very much referring to Vasari and, um, I, for that, uh, kind of took on this role of uh, a male painter. I have a, um, this is kind of me sort of in drag as that role. And kind of, I was responding to um, like, not only kind of art history in the sort of Renaissance sense, but also like beautiful orphan pieces and stuff that are in the RHA collection and kind of, looking at that role of what's expected of the artist in that way. Um, and I guess mainly, yeah, I think that I'm something with the kind of bringing it back to this, bringing it, I'm gonna finish it with the book as I started. Um, I guess with this idea of, um, I think that that, that piece in the, with, that I did with the RHA and stuff, that that was kind of, more in the sort of, it was still zany because I guess I was making this, I was trying to perform this other job that it isn't who I am or whatever. Um, but it was also, it had this kind of interesting thing as well. And that it, I'm looking at the idea of interesting as this way of like uh, trying to have a sense of like uh, objective importance to your work once you have, some sort of research back it up and be like oh this is important because I'm going to be telling you some facts about the renaissance as well um and I think um anyway I yeah I guess uh, and I, I am kind of fascinated by how with 
have frequently that that is kind of relied on even in a performance context and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a, I, I think that's a, a hopefully like a fair taste of what my work is like. Um, yeah, I think maybe I will end there if that's reasonable. Yeah, it's very reasonable. Thank you so much, Isadora. That's really enlightening. Um, Brian, can we hear from you now? <laughs> You're gonna talk about your practice for. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks, uh, Isadora. And um, I'm just gonna share the screen. So I put together some slides last night and um, I, yeah. I hope this isn't off the wall, too off the wall. But let's see. Uh, so, let me go to here. So I'm on a different computer than I usually am on. So now I want to go to this, and I want to go to full screen. So just tell me, um, are we are we on full screen there? Can you see that? Yes. So yes, yeah, so I took the. I took the title and I started to think about the word intergenerational and so I suppose that's where I, where I started from. It's, it's, so I, I kind of departed a little bit from my practice because I started to think about what is intergenerational to me and what does it mean? And then untold histories was also an important word for me that made me think, hmm, what would I reflect on? Um, so I suppose for me, the question that seemed intriguing was looking back to the 90s and I realized, oh God, I am a dinosaur from the 90s. So I think, what would I do if I, if I what did I think when I was in the 90s looking back at the generation before me? So I took probably about 25 to 30 years to be a generation. So I started to think what were the kind of investigations or what have I learned about the previous generation that's affected the generation I'm in and that affects I think the generation that... So if I try to give myself this perspective, I'm 53 years old. So if I go back to the 1990s, I'm in my 20s. Um, so I need to go back further and I wanted to link it to uh, some things which, which have been consistent. So the similarities in the past and differences as crossovers, as contradictions, and as loss and trauma and a couple of things. So the first one I wanted to, the first images I thought was just thinking about generation number one, which I'm calling roughly the 70s or 60s to the 70s, 25 years ago before I was in college, um, 30 years ago. So I went to college between 1984 and uh, I left college finally in, 1992, I finished a master. So I was in college for quite a long time. Um, and so I also started thinking about this sort of Central Europe ideas. I started thinking about America. And I, I, three images that came to mind was Eva Partum's work in uh, 1971, a Polish performance artist, uh, Rhino, Rhino Doherty, who uh, made this book called Aspen, uh, late 60s, with the work by first translations of Roland Barthes, Death of the Author and um, Bisha Foucault's Discipline and Punish, published in 1974, and then later published uh, in English. Uh, and the next thing that I thought was a legacy that was quite important to me is these two people. So um, here you see Alana Heiss, uh, who ran an, an institute for art and urban resources, and uh, was a kind of property dealer and magnet and a developer, but also a cultural agent and she set up PS1 studios and galleries uh, in the clock tower um, in lower Manhattan and uh, then moved out to Long Island City uh, where she developed the property of the PS1 school ends up being part of MoMA and it's part of what I would call a kind of a gentrification uh, thing between lower Manhattan which happens in 19, 1970 um, and this is Noel Sheridan who is the director of NCAD and a good friend of Alana Heiss. And when I was in New York, no, he's always said to me, how's Alana, how's Alana? So we put the two of them together and I, would, I knew Alana Heiss because I was in PS1 in 1995 in the middle of the 90s. So Noel's career in New York was from 64 to 70. And that's actually a really interesting period, a really interesting period of work that he did from that period. So when I look back at the previous generation, I kind of think Noel Sheridan is a very strong uh, influence on understanding that generation. So he took part in this film by, this is a film called by Rudy Burkhardt called Money. And it's written by and starring the very famous writer, Joe Brainard, who some of you might know wrote a book called I Remember, um, who is this kind of really interesting uh, queer writer who died of AIDS um, in the 1990s. Um, and what I really liked about Noel Sheridan was this involvement with film, with anthology film, with, with people like Ken Jacobs. Um, and this history, 
is quite interesting in terms of property because also it connects with Brian O'Doherty. And Brian O'Doherty was my external examiner when I was in NCAD in the 1990s, in 1980s, excuse me. Uh, and here you see in the very first show that happens in PS1 in Long Island City, you see that uh, Brian O'Doherty's work um, is there. And uh, it, it's quite interesting because he was also funding Alana Heiss's work. So it's quite an interesting crossover, which is taken up in a very famous piece called Schapalski et al., which was by um, Hans Hacke. And Hacke's work, then, is of course famously banned out of the Guggenheim. But he was making a kind of a pseudo uh, playful conceptual artwork about property development and gentrification uh, in the Upper uh, West Side of New York. Uh, and tracing links between the trustees of the Guggenheim Museum and, of course, uh, the slum uh, landlords. So this tension around the, you know, what what Alana Heiss was up to, uh, what Brian O'Doherty was involved in, and the whole kind of transformation of the Lower East Side of, of New York is really interesting in terms of someone made an artwork of the time that is a kind of investigation of actually what was going on within these circles. It, it, it's also probably, probably, some of you might know, but Rosalind Krauss owned property with Robert Morris, etc., uh, in this area. And also a connection which is really interesting to, from Noel Sheridan is with this space, which is by, which is called the Peaceye Bookstore. Again, this is very interesting countercultural uh, space. Um, here we see Allen Ginsberg in the bottom here, uh, run by a guy called Ed Saunders, who published this magazine, uh, Fuck You, a magazine for the arts. Uh, and um, that space is very interesting for, for, for working with alternative filmmakers that uh, were very much outside of this kind of gentrification tradition that I find is an, a kind of a, a legacy that I was interested in, um, in finding out more about. Um, so this is Noel Sheridan, they moved to Australia. He came to Ireland briefly and then he moved to Australia and he set up a, a very interesting um, artist research uh, agency in Adelaide and it was Experimental Art Foundation was what it's called. Yeah, Experimental Art, E-A-F. And they had very interesting work. Uh, they toured a lot of work. Uh, so Marina Abramovich and Ulai would have shown there. Stuart Brisley performed there. Uh, so when I met people in London in the early 90s, uh, like Stuart Brisley, who I studied with in the Slade and had a tutorial with Marina Abramovich, she'd ask me about Ireland. And she'd say, oh yeah, the only person I know is Noel Sheridan. Um, and I found that quite interesting because to see how Sheridan was, was involved in promoting, the, promoting their work. This is one of the spaces, again, this quite interesting idea of alternative spaces, which is the phrase that Brian and Hardy comes up with. But in terms of this as the EAF and, and the kind of work and some of the artists who were shown here in the 70s in uh, Adelaide, of course, were also from the New York avant-garde, particularly films, filmmakers like Mike Parr and stuff. Probably hard to see, but really interesting manifestos and stuff from this period. So now we come to generation, my generation. So here I am in NCAD. Uh, this is me in 1989, uh, exactly at this time, in fact, um, just before the degree show. You can see the trees have grown a little bit since then, um, but the most of the rest of the infrastructure is still the same. And I'm sitting with my really dear friend, uh, Evelyn Byrne. And Evelyn Byrne is an artist I'll refer to, who's a performance artist and uh, who tragically died from cystic fibrosis. and. Uh, so yeah, I'm a little, I look a little different, don't I? Um, and uh, so, yeah, so this is the early work that I made in, in 1989. So some of the themes that were important to me commemor it was commemoration. Uh, and this was work that was made around the Limerick Soviet. So this is a, a show that initiated out of NCAD and that went down to Limerick to commemorate the Soviet. And I thought this was quite interesting too, because if we're looking at this Central Europe and Ireland and crossovers, I'm thinking here we are as a bunch of young people kind of feeling quite radical and critical. And we're trying to re, re, kind of re, return this history that is, that is really kind of obscure, which is a Soviet, which was started in, in Limerick. Um, and, and yet in Central Europe, they're trying to escape from the Soviet state and escape from the Iron Curtain. So it's quite uh, an interesting thing that, that, that so this, this project involved lots of things, I won't go into it, but this gives you some idea of video installation using text uh, and images. Uh, and this work also struck me as a crossover because it comes from the internationality site. And I saw this work in the showroom gallery in about 1987, I think, and it's by Rashid Areen and it's called Arctic Circle. And this piece really blew me away. So I would say this is one of the most influential pieces that I'd ever seen because I was still naive about kind of institutional critique and I didn't really understand a lot of the work. I never really liked the work of Richard Long, but I found this work really powerful uh, in terms of how Rashid Areen made this work to try to talk about homelessness and what happens in the emptied spaces that 
Richard Long is the kind of great white artist goes out to, uh, where, where, did, where did those migrants come to? And they end up in London in a very tough place in the homelessness. So this idea of kind of gentrification, homelessness, one of the first artists I'd seen ever done this so successfully in a gallery. And it was remade in 2017, actually, uh, in, in Warsaw. And I found that kind of quite an interesting thing. It's done outside. It sort of struck me as a kind of a COVID thing as well. It's sort of interest to me. This is Blue Funk, and this is the kind of work that when we set up from, from college, we set up a group, we called ourselves Blue Funk. And actually, thanks to Patrick Ireland, who was our external examiner, who really encouraged us to say, you've got to try to promote this work. You've got to try to stick together, because if you, if you go on your own, you won't make it. And so that interesting idea that we decided we would try to collaborate to find a studio, and this is the work that we did. And that was quite successful for about three years that we worked. We did this very quick show. and. Took us about six months work. We were only on for 24 hours in the Douglas Hyde Gallery called State of Great Terror, which is the name of what Blue Funk is. Uh, and there were some really interesting moments for us to try to collaborate. We went to New York, we took the show in New York um, with the Grey Art Gallery. Uh, and again, we took images that were looking at historical images. This is the lockout image. We looked at the, the Dazzle painting and we made a replica of the founding stone of New York University. This is in the Philip, by the Philip Johnson uh, Library, NYU, in the Washington Square. Uh, this is another image over there. Uh, nighttime piece, sound piece, uh, uh, sound installation. Uh, we were in, we were in Sonsbeck. So very quickly, it actually gave us a platform. So so I just think it was just trying to show some of that um, that period uh, again with a kind of a, a early '90s kind of neo avant-garde thing. Looking at um, working in the, in the post office, this is the text. That we had a very interesting American curator Valerie Smith uh, for the show and published a very interesting a very interesting document um, so but also at this time was this whole problem about gentrification it's been brought up before and I don't know how much time to talk about it but it was brought up before when I was in a previous panel with, with Brian Connolly and again it's looking at what Temple Bar was and this was a very controversial time uh, for what was happening in Temple Bar and particularly around the building of this building art house of which Blue Funk were invited to be on a panel as a kind of advisors or consultants or something it was the greatest oh, travesty I can only say is the only way to describe it uh, and we put in a really detailed account of why we think this is a complete wrong move before the building opened uh, in 1995, I think, but we were involved in a panel in 93. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it was, it was a bit difficult time, actually, this, this idea of cultural tourism, cultural gentrification, again, mirroring what happened in, you could say, Lower Manhattan, Alana Heiss and all of this work in the early uh, 70s. So that was a legacy. I also was in Strokestown, so that at this stage I moved, I went to the Slade and then I went to Strokestown. So I went to live in rural Ireland, which was a really big shock to me and really interesting to work on this museum to the famine, uh, which opened in 1994. So it's quite a lot of strands and crossing over, but that commemorative thing and looking at history that kind of an artist investigation was very much part of that, but also looking at the kind of landlord class, which was what was important about property relations back in the 1840s, property relations in the in the 1970s, property relations in the 1990s, and property relations now. And actually, I could say there's a fairly continuous line there on how property relations uh, have worked. I've got a minute left. Okay. This is Evelyn Byrne. This is her video. So Evelyn Byrne was a really interesting performance artist and she was a member of Blue Funk. And this was her thesis. So for her thesis in NCAD in 1989, she made a video performance of herself as, a, as, a, as an interlocutor with herself. And it was really, uh, it's a really strong piece of work. It's in the, it's in the, it's in Nyvang. It's well worth looking at. Uh, it's on Brechtian aesthetics, and uh, again, uh, it's yeah, it's very, it's very, it's very interesting work. This we made a film about about Evelyn Burns. When I finish with, so we, in that time when she died in 1993, uh, we were left with all of her uh, kind of dot well left with documents and left with fragments of her practice, including her notebooks and her family gave us access to all the slides that she'd had. And so we thought, how can we kind of celebrate her work because she's gone and we will, people should know more about her work. So we took some scripts that she had written and uh, we turned them into a film. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it was a very difficult film to make for us actually. And what's interesting about her death, it actually changed the group dynamic a lot and we found it really difficult. But this is Noel Sheridan who very kindly uh, performed in our film, which was a very nice link uh, back and a kind of, Noel was very good on looking at film because going back to Rudy Burkhardt our, our, our working with, uh, uh, with avant-garde filmmakers in the 90, late 1960s, uh, kind of brought this connection home to us. So. That's my little bit about the kind of generational thing, but it, it sort of made me want to think to look back. And I can talk about contemporary work, 
but I can talk about that maybe in, a, in another way at another time or in, in another maybe uh, later on in the discussion. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brian. That was excellent. Uh, there's some ideas in there I'd like to ask you about a bit later because I think they're actually still really relevant today. Um, Leanne, would you like to present now? Yeah, um, I'll just share my screen. One second. Uh, so, um, hi, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening to all of us, likewise, suspended in this perpetual void. Um, thank you, Isadora, Brian. Um, feeling slight pressure to match up to this. Um, but firstly, I'd actually really like to thank uh, NCD Gallery, but particularly. Uh, Sarah uh, for inviting me to take part in this and also over the last few months actually just holding space and time with me to talk about the very much porous boundaries of performance particularly how, how they've shifted in this current climate um, and it's it's really nice to have conversations with people who don't think that performance art is great you know that like we need to critique it quite a bit um, so for this very short synopsis of, um, this is going to be a very short synopsis of my practice. Um, and I'm actually just going to show you the very first performance that I made and the very last live action that I made to an audience. Um, and this kind of stems over seven years. And in the seven years, you can astro project and kind of fill this void with a very much chaotic attempt of me trying to build some sort of, um, subjective anthology of, of, of gestures. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of just interested myself, even going back through it, through the whole thing of seeing the change, but also seeing kind of like some, some small things kind of staying and looking things with a fresh eye. Um, yeah, I think I think it's it's interesting to reflect back on the first thing that I've ever made. Um, so moving on, so back in March, 2014, um, I made what could be considered as my first uh, performance and I was entitled 47, 22, 24, 33. So the action itself consisted of me uh, standing quite still in a position on a busy street and, and counting in my head for 60 minutes. So as you can see here, this is actually CCTV footage from um, Henry Street in Dublin. And just to give like a small image description, so the, the camera was scanning the street almost as if it was searching for something. Then to the top left here, you have this sort of like circular focal point. And now in a, in a few seconds, you'll see that I'll focus on um, an individual body that's just kind of like stood there, erect, static, and there. And then around it is kind of like a more blurred out sea of um, a homogenous sea of people, of street havoc, trolleys, you know, just kind of moving in disparate directions. And um, so this figure in the top left in the circle um, in the black jacket and kind of yellowy orange pants, but I don't know why I wore them. Um, this is me, a second year NCAD student. Um, at this moment in my life, I was very much freshly introduced to the concept of performance art after doing um, a week-long workshop with Dominic Thorpe. Um, so I was quite infatuated by duration, by ephemerality, by time, by the body as the body of work. Um, and then like from the basic level of when you um, are first swept up by the world winds of performance, like those sort of things that you're first presented with, and what I'd actually really like to highlight is very much a surface level of the practice. Um, so when making this work, I was actually less concerned with gestural actions and more so interested in inaction. Um, I didn't tell anyone that I was doing this. I only kind of presented it afterwards to my tutors in NCAD. And for me, it was kind of just like an embodied experience of space through time, time through space. And interestingly, like what kind of spurred this about was um, I had just been become aware of Jill McGid's um, work evidence locker from I think 2004 uh, in the Liverpool Biennale. And 
this consisted of McGade kind of like staging these very much seductive and alluring public scenes, which was done in collaboration with the City Watch, the Liverpool City Watch, where they were um, kind of the cinematographers, you could say, of her video. And um, she then requested this footage by writing quite alluring um, love letters to the City Watch, which were like very steamy. Um, and then um, gaining this footage, but she had quite a bit of control the whole way through it. Like there was a lot of like consent and like kind of like this very much staged element to it. And I was actually really interested in losing complete lack of control of this work. Like that was my main interest. Um, and when I say lack of control, I don't mean what we're currently experiencing in live action, in performance, in theater, in, in all of these forms, in any kind of art medium where everyone has a camera readily available to their hand and your work can be like um, disseminated anywhere and everywhere. For me with this work, what was most interesting is the aspect that I do this action, it gets archived, no one looks at it and it gets deleted in 31 days. So it kind of had this, this timeline for me of, if I wanted to activate this, I would have to go through, you know, policy um, informed letter writing. Um, it would definitely veer into a different form of power dynamics. And the documentation in itself becomes like the most vital piece um, of the work. So like basically straight away after this, I started writing really like sterile clinical letters to data controllers on Henry Street um, to gain this performance documentation through the Data Protection Act. And ooh, it was eight, there was eight letters that I sent out. Four of them never replied. Three of them sent back the letter to me. And one of them replied. And after a painstaking, I need to see the title, 47 days, 22 hours, 24 minutes and 33 seconds, I received the footage. So like, hence, that's the name of the title, the duration it took to get this footage. Um, and was, what was interesting about this data controller, um, number eight, as I call him, um, was the dialogue between the two of us. Um, because he, he was generally interested in the inaction of it because in the letter I had kind of written out this thing being like some I lost something someone hid into me bumped into me and I lost my card um can I get this footage I had the exact time that I was there there was just a lot of it that was like really quite strange for him um and it was also really evident that he had watched nearly the 60 minutes of it like that he had gone through this by himself um which was also um yeah, it, it was it was really um, a great interaction and kind of like collaborative process, um, which we had spoke about pretty um, haphazardly in um, off on a street on Henry Street uh, with a, a cup of tea. And um, so the footage that you actually saw there, that was only like a few minutes of a snippet of it. So I never actually edited that footage. This is he completely edited all that work. Um, and if you were looking at it while I was talking, you'll see that like the circle with the focus has like a 15 second lag. So he had layered the, 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 film, the film footage in a way that the times never matched. So one was 15 seconds ahead the whole time. And it was kind of this like halo or aura around me as this, if I was, I don't know, impenetrable. Um, which I thought was really interesting um, and just left it at that and, and showed this. Um, so moving on from that and over the preceding years, um, my interest in performance evidently expanded from this, um, but my experience in performing became n narrowly defined. Um, so it was quite... Um, antithetical for me, what, what was happening. Um, so as a non-binary individual, I find it quite difficult, or I still find it, I found it quite difficult to harness my body in a way that the, the audience or the witness don't socially read or perceive me as a woman and that sort of constant grappling with this. Like, 
almost as oxymoronic in a sense that a non-binary artist being unsolicitedly socially read within the gender binary and it, it, it really started to shift my practice and how through so many ways that that I was trying to work with my body and use my body but it just wasn't being met in the same way through you know no fault of anyone of the witness like anyone can can reciprocate work um perceive it in their own way but it, it was just something that I felt was quite um difficult for me progressing in my practice um so something I've come back to quite a bit is Helena Goldwater's definition um of performance art where on Goldwater says performance art is my body asking your body questions and as much as I really love the simplicity of this um the abruptness the brazenness um for me it kind of encompasses this sort of essentialist theory that performance has gone down where it's the body you know this kind of following the same enigma of the artist when it's it's so much more um and i think that's probably overall my biggest critique of of art and artists and the art world in general is that we have the ability to flatten difference in the name of coalition uh, a coalition that only um favors one body and which only favors one system um so but i do think i do love this definition i just think it needs a small little tweaking and then it's like really fruitful for experiencing a much more encompassing um embodiment um of performance so if um we look at it then it's my gendered race sex body asking your gendered race sex body questions um were sexed is more so due to sexuality not uh, biology um i think this is definitely not the end of this definition like due to time constraints and the way that my practice is going down for this presentation like this could have so much more intersectional um identity markers um class ability ethnicity um and so on so as an artist um reckoning with my own positionality where I'm a white queer, um, I'm a white gendered queer body, um, which is predominantly the crux of my work, then I'm constantly in this sort of uh, state of navigation. For the gender the public may allocate onto me, may align or misalign or, or shift with my own gender identity. And then a failure occurs, like a failure occurs in my practice um yet in a way of moving through this and taking something from this failure is very much a subjective matter um failure is measured off the success of what is set by a heteronormative society and with that in mind i wholeheartedly welcome my body and my body of work as an as an archive of failures um, an archive which actively attempts to go against um, and transgress, transgress the system. Um, yeah, yeah. So moving on to the final slide of my um, presentation. Um, and this is actually my last live action to um, an audience and took place in March 2020, six years after the CCTV footage. Um, and this took place in uh, Tunnaby Studios in London um, for a Steakhouse Lies and Performance Spaces uh, event, Slow Sunday. Um, and in this image, there's two images here. There's one on, it's actually quite difficult to discern from them now, but there's one on the left and then there's one on the right. Um, so in the image on the left, I'm straddling a motorbike, um, which is facing towards like um, a dead end ramp, which ascends into the, the wall and then goes up into the ceiling. Um, so even when the, the motorbike isn't turned on, it's quite evident the, nar the narrative of this work. So if, if I drive, I crash. Um, so enclosed within, it's, I was enclosed within these four walls, um, quite a small, small room um and I, I started to kickstart this bike it was an antique bike so I started kickstarting it and over the the course of three hours the room started to fill with um toxic fumes 
uh, with the exhaust fumes, um, which kind of came in and out because the, the bike was so unpredictable um kept cutting out kept coming back in and um over time individuals became hazed out like people formed this homogenous hole where you couldn't actually decipher bodies from each other um as the three hours progressed and co then coming this is the last gesture from from the from the action um at this moment i stood on the ramp facing the bike uh, fully naked but the, the bike battery was slowly dying out um, and the light was just very much going to like um, a dim sort of level and just stayed lit just above my pubic bone um, until finally it caught out and the whole room just went into darkness and the, the performance was over. Um, so with this performance in mind and like actively ref reflecting on the current climate we're now in as a live action artist, I kind of just want to actually end by um, reading out the words by Tom Gunn in his poem in Time of Plague, which explores the, the queer erotics of compressed time and impending mortality. Um, so, my thoughts are crowded with death, and it draws so oddly on the sexual that I am confused, confused to be attracted by, in effect, my own annihilation. Thank you. Thank you. That was really great. Um, thank you all. Um, that, that was a really, really uh, well presented overview of each of your practices. Um, I'm struggling as to where we should begin because there's so much rich material that you, that you presented that we could start with, but just because Leanne, you went last and it's the freshest in my memory. I'm curious about this, um, my gendered race, sex, body, asking your gendered race, sex, body questions. And that I think for me brings up a lot of these questions around um, identities and performance, which is such a pivotal theme that I think every performance artist at some point has to consider. So I think I just want to, first of all, pose the question of what role does national and or political identity hold for you in your practice? Is it something that you can repel? Is it something that you harness? Um, I'd be curious to see what, what you guys have to say. Is that to me or is that an open question? <laughs> It's an open question to everybody, but um, since you're speaking, Leanne, if you'd like to start. Um, identity is huge for me, not even in performance. I think in general identity um, is, is pivotal. And I think it's a, it's a much more encompassing way that I think we should be moving forward, particularly as, as artists, we should reckon, not make work that's predominantly focused on our identity, but reckon with our identity and making work our position in making this. Um, in terms of, of nationality, I, I think, I know Brian would have more, has worked with national identity um, in his practice, but I, my only experience with performance and national identity is through living abroad um, and studying in Poland for a year, a year and a half, and then living abroad for three years in Poland and um, performing at festivals or performing at exhibitions and um, people denying that I was Irish because I didn't have Irish performance, that, 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 that there was a national performance, that every country had this sort of national performance, that there was a performance aesthetic, that there, there was a Polish aesthetic, that there was an Irish aesthetic. And I remember being pushed that question at a very young age, and it was at that moment that I wanted to be non-national in any form of my performances, as much as I could, like evidently things happen and, you know, national symbols come up. Um, but I, I would, mostly try to st steer away from it. Maybe that's because I haven't lived, I have been in and out of Ireland for predom the predominant amount of my practice. So I think it's maybe a better question for the other two. 
Brian, can you speak to this Irish aesthetic? Are you, is this something you're familiar with? Yeah, it's, I, yeah, I am familiar, yeah. I mean, it's funny, as, as a sort of anecdotally, you know, when Blue Funk went, Blue Funk went to Australia, um, actually because Noel Sharon left NCAD and went to run PICA, which was the Perth Institute of Contemporary Art, kind of to repeat what he'd done with the Experimental Art Foundation in Adelaide, although the world had changed. So it was no longer the 1970s, and this was a very different kind of thing. So in fact, P Perth Institute of Contemporary Art looked a little bit like Temple Bar, uh, and the gentrification project, and that really wasn't what Noel was 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 into at all. Um, so while I put Noel and Alana Heist together as buddies, they were quite different in terms of Noel didn't wasn't into making a property empire, but 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 some of the respondents of people because it was called New Art from Ireland. I wasn't in an Irish art show, which is thankful, but it was the opening show of Pika. But actually, response to, response from audiences where people were expecting more work about Ireland. And, and that was maybe related to other members of Blue Funk, but actually quite a lot of the work of Blue Funk was connected to Irish issues or questions or investigations that were connected to Ireland. So, but the mediums, what people didn't like was they felt this was kind of international avant-garde work because it was all screen-based, technology-based, mostly technology-based work. Um, and in that sense, people associate that, associated that with a kind of international avant-garde and therefore felt that nationalism is a kind of vocabulary as people might say sort of ethnic or folk vocabulary. But I don't know, I mean, I think, yeah, it's a big issue. It was a big, it's a, we, we actually ran some really se big seminars actually on national identity, trying to invite artists in like Brian McGuire and Robert Bala and people get very hot under the collar in the 1980s about this because it was such a challenge. Um, and yeah, it's very, it's very difficult. Um, we could spend a whole seminar on it, but it's a big issue. It is a big issue. It's maybe less of a big issue. I, but I still think with Brexit, you can see how nationalism is always um, appearing. You see, even with this pandemic, with this idea of put on the national jersey, this idea of, of, of a forced kind of collectiveness that we have when we have lots of problems. And I suppose we have also successes, which was the Good Friday Agreement, in terms of how you could have a fluid national identity or no national identity. And still be recognized but then that's kind of rolled back on we had this horrible citizens referendum you might remember in 2003 2004 where 75 percent of the population voted to remove uh, birthright national identity from immigrants who arrive in this country who are undocumented i mean are absolutely horrendous so I, I would love to campaign to repeal that um i think people who, who arrive here with no papers who are born here are perfectly entitled to the full protection of irish and european citizenship so yeah Kind of co complicated question, yeah, but definitely there, definitely a strong question for everyone, I think. Uh, Sarah, you're muted. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, thank you, Brian. Uh, I'd love to ask you more about that, but I'm, I'm really aware that Isadora's practice is quite, like all of your practices are very varied and quite different, so I'm, I'm curious, how Isadora sees identity or national identity or political identity um, in her practice? Um, yeah, it was actually um, hearing Leanne talk about this idea of um, how you're read as a performer and your identity and stuff of so much within my work, even though that I don't think that I'm grappling with, like it's just this idea of when you are when your body is read in a particular way even when you're trying to maybe like make work against that or even outside of the context of that and what it means um is something that i feel like especially in performance everyone the with performance you're always kind of trying to figure out that weird relationship between your identity and your body and and trying to have some sort of expectation of how the audience is going to read it I, I frequently feel that sometimes is if like if I'm read as like a woman then it's harder for me to be um for for there to be like an ease and a kind of like sense of humor with my work so a lot of the first pieces that I did um like a lot of the first pieces I did, I would have done in drag as a man because I thought that that would be, a, and like, I, I remember I did, yeah, a show in, in Temple Bard that I, yeah, was, I, I thought that the way that I could be this, the, 
the way that I could best present this text that I writ was written would be as a man that, that that could be. So I guess that tension um, of trying to, it was just really interesting hearing how it lands, figuring out with kind of their own identity, um, how you, yeah, how you figure out that presentation and that weird thing that you're never going to be able, you know, the desire is to be able to, Hello, sorry, Isadora, you cut off there. Might have thought, yeah, it might have, it looks like it's it looks like frozen. Maybe just to add on to what Isadora, even though I'd love for Isadora to hear this as well. So hopefully, Isadora, you have just been frozen and you can hear me. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, when I started off, I was still a student um, when I was performing um, f first. Um, I similarly used to, um, the way that I would dress was I was actively trying to be perceived as a man because it's something I've grappled with for quite quite a, a, a while. Um, and I'm now kind of seeing it, it's because I was only shown that successful performance artists were men um, and I wanted to be taken seriously. Um, and there was, I didn't want to be read as, um, a maternal figure, which is, happens quite a bit. Um, I think I think there's a thing when you can reckon with how you will be read and you can disidentify with it. So you 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 stand under a marker and you know this go, this goes on all things. This, this could be done with nationality. It could be done with gender identity. It can be done. Maybe no, it can't be done with everything. That's too general of a thing. But for example, to to maybe step away from from gender identity and maybe towards nationality. So if I was going to make a work somewhere and they all know that um, I'm an Irish performer and they're all quite aware of Irish performance style, which is very much slow, um, it's at a slower pace, it's quite mediated, um, and jarring that and going and showing them something completely different and kind of disidentifying with it and um, grappling with that I, I think as well like in in my own work it's something that I do quite a bit is I reckon I I know how I'll be read and I'll feed into that and then I'll metaphorically shake you from that um yeah um Brian do you have any thoughts on that or anything to add? Well, I mean I immediately think I always find like what do people mean by Irish I mean I just find this is a kind of very interesting concept like because you break that down into so many, so many pluralities that are there, which, um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a tricky one. The fact that you come from art, you come from a you come from a place, and the place can dictate certain things that people expect. But I also would be very open to you have multiple identities. It's different contexts when those identities are important. Different yeah. times they push up against things. Um, I'm not in a relativist thinking everything is everything is okay. Meaning. I know when I come to a border checkpoint, I put my hand in my pocket, I have a passport, it means I will get through this, but other people have no passports, they will not get through, they've no, they've no identity that's got to be recorded. And so I can see the privileges that I have about having an Irish identity, uh, meaning whatever, whatever that means, but I do struggle with what, what this is. I think we have a, we are really, uh, I always say this, but it's terrible, but we are a really dysfunctional country, like incredibly dysfunctional place. And we live with incredible paradoxes and contradictions, not least the famine, which I spent a lot of time working on. It's just an extraordinary watershed of what's happened and how we approach other countries and how we try to play with the big characters in, in Europe when we have a completely different history um, of what's happened uh, to us So uh, and what we've been involved in. So yeah, I find it interesting actually where Ireland, if I was to be born anywhere else, I don't know. That's the question I was asked myself, would you like to be, like to be born somewhere else? Uh, I'm not too sure, um, but I, yeah, I find it Ireland's quite a, I think I've struggled a lot if I was born in Britain. I find when I talk to British people, they really struggle with their identity. Um, they have lots of complications there. And there's lots of issues uh, around it. And I think that's a tough one, actually, it's tough. Um, Isadora, are you back with us? 
Sorry about that. <laughs> I my uh, computer. No, you're fine. From my phone, and it's a little bit crazy. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, I mean, there's there's so much there. I mean, I can speak even. I'm no longer a artist. When I was an artist in art school, um, when I was an NCD, I would make performances and I would always cover my face with my hair. And I remember I had tutors who would always try to kind of tap that into some sort of Romanian identity of like oppression and communism that my parents fleed. Um, and I never related to any of that. I really wanted to separate myself from that as much as possible and make some sort of a non-national identity, almost like I would be a clone of myself that didn't have that kind of past. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know if that's, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think with identity, I agree. Uh, oh, sorry. I think I agree with Brian in terms of like, it's, it's, how, how did you say it, Brian? It's, fluctuating not fluctuating but it, it changes um space is completely dependent on it and I think in regards to to making work and in, in all mediums and forms and particularly in my opinion from working in live action audience makes a huge difference so you can like if the, the way you gear work if if you know your audience is going to be quite used to or quite um open and kind of not putting you into these categorized boxes then it changes the platform it's actually almost like the most wonderful thing to see this happen and it's kind of um maneuvering your work through that but I think audience and space is a huge factor on that as well um yeah yeah sorry about that <laughs> um Brian do you have anything to add in terms of audience maybe no, but it's funny, I've been connected with Liverpool and uh, you talked about Liverpool Biennial and, and I, I asked them, you know, why, why, do you, why do you show so few Irish artists? Mm. And they said, well, we don't, the, the principle of the Liverpool Biennial is not to show domestic artists. And I said, but we're not, Ireland is not domestic, but, but to many people in the UK, Ireland is perceived as domestic. And I remember when I went to the Slade first and I was looking for accommodation and I went, walked into the Overseas Students Accommodation Bureau and I said, have you got anywhere to stay? And they said, this is only for foreign students. And I said, well, I, I come from the Republic of Ireland. I, I come from a separate country. I'm entitled to be, as, I'm, as, I'm as much a different country as Japan is. Um, but that's not recognized. I find that, now, this is old, this is old time, but it endures because there's only recent discussion in the Liverpool Biennial. It's a very interesting, situation about how how the Irish and Britain I think that's a huge factor so many people for, of, of Irish origin are in Britain and how they try to figure out so in the 1990s I was involved with selling a newspaper called the Irish Reporter which was kind of a post-colonial Marxist newspaper um, and it was really interesting the hostility you got um, there was no Irish radio in London for example in the 1990s it was impossible to listen to RTE so much so, I'm not a conspiracist, but at the time I did believe it was jammed. You could listen to radio from Azerbaijan in London. It was such a plural community. It's incredible. London's a super brilliant city, but you couldn't get Irish radio. Uh, you just could not tune RTE uh, at all. And I find that really interesting when we campaign to try to get an Irish radio station. Um, it's all changed with the internet. It's all different, a totally different set of relationships now, but and positive relationships. Mm -hmm. So, but I do think there is interesting questions comes up about our relationship with such a big country beside us, such a powerful country actually, dictates a lot for us. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's a lot to unpack in that, but I think I wanna continue this conversation into talking maybe about um, durational performance. Um, I think, Durational performance was something that was, duration and performance was obviously so, and still is such a key ingredient in how performance works. Um, I'm wondering how you feel it's perhaps changed. Um, Brian, obviously you've been working in the field a long time. Have you seen a shift in how people approach duration, how artists or students? Uh, 
Yeah, I'll have maybe pass to Leanne or, or to Isadora. I'll, I'll just think about that for a minute. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's a big question. Yeah. Um, Isadora, how do you see duration in, in your performance? I suppose I with um, I suppose that I quite frequently would have like sort of contain very contained performances, but the durational element comes in the fact that I'll quite frequently be repeating them like over and over again. So just to try and kind of because I'm kind of fascinated by that sort of uh, weird both like exuberance and exhaustion that you get when you are constantly running the same performance over and over again and how each kind of performance then has a different feeling that's very much based off of the different audiences that you're responding to because I'm used to um, working with very like intimate audiences and very much responding to what the audience is giving me which is you know of course the sort of thing that you really miss now of all times, you know, because we don't have that kind of liveness or whatever. But I guess the, that in my own work, that would be my own um, approach to durational work or responding to that kind of using time in that way. Mm -hmm. And Leanne, how, how would you approach it in your practice? Um, just to feed into to Isadora, and we, we spoke about this ourselves, um, me and Isadora, that when talking, we were contrasting and comparing our own practices that I, I don't repeat work. I do them, and I think that's really interesting to when speaking to people. Um, I don't repeat performances um, for, for reasons I don't know. Um, and I like actively respect anyone who does repeat uh, performances and it's not this, this sort of I'm phrasing this all really bad we, I said this all much better yesterday um but um basically that that's a really interesting thing in two people's practices who are, are happening at the same time um you know I think that's that's really interesting in in terms of dur duration in terms of the, the 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 mystic of duration and performance I think I see from seeing people working now, I see that there's either two ways people work with, before, with duration. They'll either make the decision before they make the performance, I wanna make a 12 hour durational performance and then they'll slot a concept onto that or an action onto that. Or there's the really interesting ones that people are like, I really wanna do this action. I really wanna do this, this live action. I really wanna do this. And it goes on for 12 hours. So those, those are the two things that are happening in my opinion right now. Um, duration, I think, has somewhat been conflated, like durational performances have been conflated with um, painstaking hours, whereas I, I think duration has, is completely um, in tangent happening with intensity. I think three minutes can be a durational performance if the intensity is there. And that it's a, it's a moment where everyone feels every second going past, that's, that's durational for me. Um, as much as three hours, as much as 12 hours. Um, but I do think there's this thing, particularly when you leave university, this kind of having to have a durational under your belt as like a, a pass, a way of, of, of gaining um, like leverage um, in the live action uh, community, um, which is something, it's, it's good to maybe try it, but you know, not to be upset when it's not for you um yeah um yeah, brian I, mean, I want to get your take on this but i will also ask oh sorry okay um i'm curious i don't know if this is true but is it could it be possible that like leanne was saying um, it's kind of one of those things that you have on your belt. It kind of almost proves your practice in a way that you can endure that. And you, you're like tapping into like this deep history of durational performance and you're bringing that kind of almost to v validate what you're doing. I don't know if that's something that you think is happening. I, I'm going to answer this thing. I've done a durational. It was horrific. It was a really bad work. It was, I, I, and I came to the realization that I did it just to get, to, to kind of get my foot in the door with that and trying to do it. 
there are ways like John Cord, for example, and his concept around doing durational alone is really interesting that they'll start at 9 a.m. to get the commuters on their way to work and be there at 5 p.m. when they're leaving again so that they'll be like, oh, this mom is doing this for the day. Like that, that's really interesting. That's quite jarring. Um, but yeah, well, I don't know what other, what Isadora and Brian might want to add or think to, towards that. Yeah, I guess with that idea of like having someone under the belt or whatever, I um, something that I've really hard, like a narrative that I have a really hard time getting out of my head, which I think that Susan Sontag puts really well is this idea of like, um, this is a real dated narrative, but the idea of artist as exemplary suffer, like that, that like you've proven that your work is really good when you're suffering. And um, I feel like as I've, through the years of my practice of figuring out that like, maybe I, maybe I um, maybe I don't have to suffer to be able to make good work that maybe it could be, even though I'm not saying that you can do a durational performance and there can be like, there's certain enjoyments and highs to that and stuff as well, of course, but just to try and get this idea of like what the idea of like, like suffering has to do with art making and stuff and separating that and knowing, yeah, when, when it's the right time for that or when your own work or not. Um, so yeah, I guess, cause I think when I, um, when I've done these shows where I'm like, you know, f like quite frantically doing like, like five or six performances just in a row, <laughs> just like right after, right after just repeating, 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 um, is like, just knowing like what, yeah, like what the point of doing that is and make, I don't know. Yeah. Just, I, that I, that's something that I've just figured out, um, as I make more work and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, felt the yeah, need to suffer. <laughs> I think you know I, I'm trying to think of work that I've seen that maybe impressed me in in uh, whether I thought the length of time and I think how absorbed somebody is in the work is is probably really important in live work and that sense of what that I, I don't know if the word absorption is but if the investigation is going to take a time it's going to take time it's not going to be done uh, quickly uh, and. If, it's, if there's got to be a journey, then there's got to be a journey. And if it's, you know, I suppose that's that's something that you'd, you'd I mean, I'm trying to think back of work where I've come come and go from live work and I've went, oh yeah, that's, you know, I can see like quick snappy pieces by work years ago I used to watch by the Desperate Optimists. And then I can see work by Anne Tallentire or Sandra Johnson, which takes much, much longer because the investigation is just going to take for a long time to look at a space, to work in a space to work with a material or to move something from one point to another. So I suppose, but then if I see something like Steve McQueen and a building is falling directly on top of you and you're standing in the, you know, it doesn't need to go any, any longer, you know, that's the piece. And you're like, wow, that's such a, but the build up to that was the arc of a piece of work is it's the length of time before you make a piece of work. So you, you're like, I mentioned Blue Funk's 24 hour piece that happened in, in the Douglas Hyde, but it was six months work by, six people it's a lot of hours uh a lot a lot of hours to make a piece of work like that where for the audience it's quick and it's like like a club you walk into something that's everything's moving everything's happening but in a way there's been a the duration of that work started a long time ago to be built to a piece which reaches a certain point it had an opening the place was closed it was chaos and then it's over so that that performative thing happens but and then there's a legacy afterwards of what a piece of work is, this kind of afterlife, you know, like this is theme of the conference, I suppose, was where the stuff just keeps, keeps on heading out into space. So I find this interesting idea, actually, of where we bracket time. I don't even like bracketing decades. I don't find that useful, particularly. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it is a curious, it's a, always a great thing for art is to look at a relationship to time. Mm. That might be um, a nice segue into this idea of after effects and the afterlife of performance. Um, I think it changes a lot. Um, and I think it's it's probably a thing that every performance artist has to consider at some point, um, this, this relationship you have with your practice and documentation. Um, of course, I mean, I believe that performance has a lot to owe to photography and video and documentation for allowing us to study performance in the past to kind of maybe popularize the, the, the act of doing it as a practice. Um, 
but I mean, it's a contentious thing, right? Your performance with the documentation. Um, I can even, I'm even thinking of like extremely influential uh, theorists, people like Peggy Phelan, who um, literally say performance's only life is in the present, that performance becomes itself through this appearance. Um, I think she also says, to the degree that performance attempts to enter the economy of reproduction, it betrays and lessens the promise of its own ontology. And it's, I mean, this is 1993, she's writing that it's a betrayal to let performance live on outside of the moment. So, and I mean, we can also think about very <laughs> obvious examples, people like Tino Segal, who refused to have any trace of performance, any documentation. So with that said, I know now it's quite hard to control how your performance lives on, seeing as everyone has a camera in their pocket, everyone has access to an audience that they can share the performance with. Um, that's very different, I'd imagine, to performance happening in the 70s, 80s, 90s, when it, you probably had a bit more control. Um, so my question is, what's your relationship to documentation and how do you kind of work around that? Um, I don't know if Leanne, you want to start? Uh, 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 documentation. Um, I suppose those quite stark and harsh words of Peggy Phelan and this use of portrayal. Um, I think performance art, like every medium, um, evolves with the time that it's involving with. You know, this, like, I only made, I only documented my first uh, performance by video a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, and refused to use video before that. And to be honest, I don't know why I refused. Um, and I think it's because I was told it was bad. Um, and then I had lost so much work that I couldn't actually put into applications to make a living. Um, so I think it's 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 interesting um, in regards to photography, uh, photo documentation I've used more so. I've like grappled with uh, asking people or asking the documenter to only use film photography um, so that it's kind of like only maybe three shots are taken. Um, that sort of idea as well. Um, but then that kind of goes into like a level of like aesthetic. It kind of goes down this this route. Um, documentation, documentation. Probably one of the least spoken about things in my own practice, I must admit. Oh, the, the photos that I showed you there of the last work, that was the only two photos taken because it was in a, a space like that, that if documentation was being actively done throughout that, it would have turned into a different piece of work. Um, so like you can call and choose when, uh, predominantly for me, it's always the live work that comes first and then the documentation kind of happen on the side. Um, but yeah, maybe pass this over to someone who has a better answer than me. I'm just going to ask you one more question, Leanne, because the first work you showed us from your, yeah. um, when you're standing on Henry Street, I mean, that's a performance that's very heavily based in the surveillance that's happening there. So those things seem to be very closely linked. Um, yeah, and I think it's interesting now coming back, coming back to where I am. Um, at the beginning, I was very much interested in, in those sort of things, but I realized then that there was more to it. You know, I was kind of at the superficial level of the body. You know, I hadn't transgressed my own way of thinking that there's so much more than documentation and stuff like that. But I do think that like it was a really interesting avenue to go down. Um, but um, on that note, oh, now um, making work in a time where uh, you want to experience live work, you don't want to live stream, you don't want to kind of do that sort of thing um, or making the decision to not make any work over the last year, which I've predominantly done. I haven't made any performances. Um, and now reckoning and grappling with, okay, I am going to have to look into documentation. I am going to have to look at this and to explore this as an avenue and um, for it to happen in, not to be an afterthought, to be one of the active thoughts throughout. Um, so yeah. Um, Brian, I'm curious as to, you've been in this industry 
industry is a bad word, <laughs> in this kind of developing practice for a really long time. Have you seen differing relationships to documentation and in your own practice? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's 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 a curious one about what 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 is documentation, uh, and I think you're right. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of things. Most of the work I uh, work I make is time based, so it's not like it's held. It's it's back to the story of, of Evelyn Byrne and what do you do with with a performance artist's work? Is there a legacy? Can you talk about the work? How would you recreate the work? And we were very conscious in trying to make a film that we weren't making a film by oh, why don't we reshoot her. Our videos which do exist in Nival and we you can look at them and and of course if I look at them I have a lump in my throat because there she is as a as a 20 year old woman who's who's now dead and so that same would look at Morris O'Connell where we, when when the presentation with Brian talks about his work with him and so this idea about what's left as a as a presence of somebody uh, how they exist in in this techno technological media I find that quite interesting so I really love that book on Marked I've always found that Peggy Feelings are such a challenge, that question's in such a challenge. And there's very interesting kind of queer theory looking at, you know, Jose Esteban Munoz writing about kind of the dialogue about, about um, Peggy Feelin and, and about kind of queer performity, which I presume, you know, like Leanne, you, 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 that, would, that would echo with you. For me, I've always felt that the, that the works were the works. The works were very much context, time specific, and they don't get remade. and uh, sometimes little bits of them do, and then you have to try and think about them in a quite a different way. Um, and I find that just the way of the of the inflection of it. But you would take images of it because then you have some kind of memory. Because actually, with time, unfortunately, with our brains, that's why you can't remember a lot of lots of details in a work. You can't take it all in where you are at the moment. And if you make a piece of work that is performative, you probably need to have take seriously that role and maybe look at it for your own practice. But I think that is important professionally. You always encourage students to have documentation because that is the competitive world of trying to get some grants and trying to, but you'd always put a, a, a kind of classifier on it and say, this is documentation. This is another version of the event. This is not the event. This is not the piece. So if I make ephemeral work, I can document it. And if that work, if I really want to make that work, I can make that documentation disappear as well. And I suppose more and more now, maybe with people more technologically sophisticated, they can realize actually this work is only given to you for a short amount of time and then it vanishes. And I suppose we have to live with that more than in the older world. It was very much the art world was governed by materials that are permanent, that are you know, not going to fade like oil paint and this kind of idea, this, this preservation of value because it was money being traded. At. And now that market has opened up completely. People will buy anything bit of dust or by a smell, doesn't matter. Uh, and that's that's kind of sad in, in some level because in the time, artists of the avant-garde thought that they would take down the system a little bit by saying my work is ephemeral, I'm taking Shea, it takes a year to do my work. No one's going to own this work. But in terms, now they go, yeah, no problem, I'll buy it. I don't care, I'll buy a Tina Segal. They sell them all the time. And you think, well, there's something kind of weird here. Artists have to be more inventive because that, that has been closed off, I think. Um, thank you. Um, I, I want to pose this question to Isadora, but I, I think it kind of works differently in your practice, Isadora, because you are willing to restage performances or at least perform something multiple times. Does the idea of documentation work differently in your practice because it's not as set in the exact moment as maybe more traditional practices would be? Um, I think that actually what Leanne was speaking to really felt familiar. I felt like I really, when I first started making performances, I don't know why I had this like real like knee jerk reaction of like no documentation nearly, you know, like I was really hesitant towards it because I really do believe that there is something with live performance that no matter what, even though I was repeating these things that they're, that they are incredibly still very context and time specific and I hated the idea of like a video being lived on and through it without it being actually what the performance was so and I think I mean this is quite cynical but I guess it's what, what Brian was speaking to as well I mean the reason why I started documenting my work was for the purpose of applications and uh, you just kind of have to do that currently and and I wonder like if I didn't have to document work to kind of prove that I make it to the, the powers that be, like 
would I? I don't know. But I mean, because of documentation, I've collaborated with like, a, like an amazing photographer, Koch Fahi has like photographed most of my work. And I really like cherish those photographs so much now, even though at the time I was like, oh, I don't want it to be expressed in this way. But I'm clearly, as you know, at the moment, I, I'm genuinely trying to like balance you all on a coffee pot so that you can see me like documentation is still something and working with cameras and stuff is stuff that I really like struggle with and have this hesitancy towards. I also really want to talk to what Brian was talking about um, with the when you're dealing with documentation and the um, kind of the weight of that when you um, are uh, are dealing with kind of memory or commemorating a person because um, I, one of went because just it's really fascinating hearing about your work with Emer Byrne and it really because um, one of one of my collaborators Maury, Mo, Moira Brady Averill passed away and that uh, and that looking back on the documentation of her performances and then figuring out how I would commemorate her work and our work together um, in my own work now is something that I think is something that I grapple with in maybe every piece that I make. So I think that even though, I mean, documentation is a funny one because you want the like the superficial thing of being like, oh, like how am I gonna make this in any way have like the life or attraction that it had as a live performance but then also, no matter what, I mean, you know, whatever, Roland Barth or whatever, I mean, every time that you're dealing with any sense of photography um, or film of something, you're going to be dealing with death somewhat, which I think, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to end with that one, but you know what I mean? I, I, it's something that, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think it's interesting, but a, a lot of the digital world now, like if you look at Snapchat and so much stuff is just evanescent, it's just to disappear. It's just quick, quick send your story and it vanishes. And this, this whole world does actually, I think there's huge gaps now. If I was to look back, I probably have more stable actual, because there are end prints and photographs of my time in college than many people have who've been taking photographs every day or 10 times a day or 100 times a day just to post off to where they are. Now, I know they go as a kind of digital residue, but there's this vapor around of so many images being made, but they're not holding. Nobody's holding them anymore. And then we change a database, a company goes down, a social media platform's gone. All that, all that stuff's gone. And people go, actually, I wonder where, wonder where my past is. Do I have any records? What, what was it like at, at certain things? So there's a funny kind of flooding of the market of the, of the image. And yes, there's not, a, there's not a holding on to the image at all. Like it's gonna be hard to document. I, I look back, I'm always looking back at the, at the documents. I mean, the big thing I'm searched for is photographs of the Irish famine. Photographers were in Ireland, they were taking photographs. Where are the photographs? This is the question, you know? Uh, so. That, but you know, in the future, you're going to say there's loads of images, but we don't know what's we haven't a clue what's going on. But it's the actual opposite. There's too many images, and they've just disappeared. Um, Leanne, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think it was said very well. So no, I don't have anything to add on to it. Excellent. Um, we have another couple minutes, so. If if anybody watching does have any questions, uh, we can spend the last five minutes um, answering questions if they do come in. Um, I will say that um, this thing of Peggy Phelan, um, her kind of definition, this very rigid definition of performance is something that I think um, a lot of practitioners today have some sort of issue with. Um, or are trying to challenge in some way. Um, I know my, my entire research is based on maybe developing or building on this, this kind of definition of performance um, because it's, it, it does seem too rigid to appropriately contextualize the performance that's happening today. Um, so yeah. Um, any, um, I don't see any questions coming in, but I'll just ask if any of you have any final thoughts on this topic that you'd like to close out on. I think uh, it just kind of came into my mind there with um, Brian bringing up um, Jose Esteban Muniz and 
Evelyn Byrne and then Isadora speaking of your collaborator as well and it's interesting because um, as well um, Jose Esseramun has just released a book about two months ago that was posthumously after his death composed anyway of um, kind of essays and notes that he had been collecting and, and he, he writes predominantly about, uh, it's called Sense of Brown is this book, but it's it's about performance, but performance done by people of color and viewed through the lens of queer theory and um, disidentifications is like a, a huge, um, a huge give into um, performance studies. Um, but it's interesting in terms of reading someone's work as well after the the process of them passing away and you know that the work has been compiled as well why as they've also passed away mark fisher is also a, a huge example so many people read ghosts and don't realize that mark fisher is actually not alive and then become there's so many texts that have been written about that in in um afterwards then to this sort of manifestation then and this sort of like enigma of Mark Fisher um and it's 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 really interesting how that actually goes beyond performance it goes on to a lot of of mediums um it's really interesting in, in writing as well I think yeah yeah I mean a big film that was a really tough film to watch because it connects with Ethan Byrne it's another artist with cystic fibrosis who was the performance artist Bob Flanagan and so the film is Bob Flanagan, super artist, and he dies on screen. And it's really, really, really tough film to watch. Uh, he keeps asking for the camera to be turned off as he's dying. And his partner keeps the camera running. And, uh, and that was the deal. But it's a really tough film uh, to, to look at. Um, yeah, this is a bit, there's, that, there's that connection. Um, there's a good, a good student at NCD doing his, P, doing his PhD. Um, Robert Clark and I'm working with him a lot and he's doing some really really interesting work on that and he's there's a film called The Portrait of a Man Dying I think it's the Silver Lake but the Silver Lake is a man dying of AIDS and again it's this documentation and how documentation connects to death sorry for being a downer on that subject but it is and Jose Esteban Munoz yeah of course is a is a tragic death and um, yeah it's it's there's a lots in it there's lots of, I suppose, that, yeah, I, I mean, I think documentation is such a rich area, like all these areas, it's such a rich area to, in, to engage with and not to be superficial about it, to be, you know, this is a really important thing to think about your work. And then maybe at the end, it is important then to say, that's it, because now it's become by the, by the archive, turn it into this, turn it into that, commodify this memory, commodify this history all the time. That you figure out your own escape plan to say I'll, and i'll remove all my stuff in this particular way if that's what you'd like mm -hmm. to do thank you for that um this has been a really rich conversation uh, we do have one comment here in the q a um andrea neil says i enjoy amanda coogan's perception on durational performance significantly she talks about syncing with the audience over time and going through exhaustion to take the performance to a different level um, I might just end on that. Um, thank you all for your time, contribution. Um, oh, Hilary uh, Gilligan has another comment here, more of a comment than a question. In my personal experience, 1989 artists do not have um, a durational under their belt. Irish life performance action artists have such a variety of practice. I do not think it could be identified as slow. Often the junction panels do not look at videos due to time. So still photos are better. Could I actually give a comment on that? I, I want to say that that was commented by me when I was studying in Poland, that people identified the Irish performance in Poland. They were thinking of predominantly of Alistair MacLennan, who is based in Northern Ireland. And that was kind of the huge marker of performance for people living in, in, in Poland. And being taught there was that they recognized Irish performance as slow. It's not my own um, comment on on the practice, but that was kind of their their marker of it and how to reckon with that, um, how to reckon with that while living there for three for three years um, more. So yeah, interesting. But yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, yeah, I mean, we're out of time now. Yeah, sorry, please, Brian, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, no. It reminds me of a famous comment by Jean Fisher about the work of Alan O'Kelly. Mm. And what she what she what she identifies in the work is non-European silences, which is a really interesting one to try to tease out. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> what that might mean. Cool. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for NCD for having us and for um, giving us this platform to speak. Um, take care, everyone.